Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, and this week we have a legit hacker who has hacked a ton of devices. He's going to be sharing with us about those exploits, how he's been able to do it, why he's done it, and some of the concerns that it raises. Stick around. Live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 644, and I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Sasha Rickman. Hey, uh, before we jump into a very exciting show this week, I want to remind you to subscribe to us on YouTube and click that bell. That's going to make sure that you receive all the notifications whenever we are live or when we post new shiny videos. Mm -hmm. It's what the cool people do. So do it. <laughs> <laughs> I started seeing the rounds of the exploits of the Canadian hacker. Mm -hmm. As Twitter blew up with people saying, I came into work today and on my printer was this printout. And the printout was from the Canadian hacker. He is the politest hacker that you'll ever meet. He will hack your devices and then apologize. <laughs> He is none other than the Canadian hacker. Hey there, how's it going? Fantastic. How about yourself? I'm not doing too bad. Yeah. Not too bad at all. Yeah. Listen, you, you call yourself the Canadian hacker. Just to give us a sense of the scale of things, how many, how many devices have you seriously hacked? I mean, I've hacked about 150 devices. How many devices have you hacked? Well, for the printers, I've hacked 100,000 of them. <laughs> I mean, 100,000 printers. Yeah. Why'd you hack printers? Well, m my mo main motivation for doing all this was to give myself more of a challenge uh, without really affecting the people around me. Um, and when you say that, when you say without affecting, are you talking about being benign in your attacks? So that you're not actually yeah. creating damage, you're, yeah. you're just being more of like a black hat hacker. That's not what I want to go over, right? Like Fair more ethical hacking would be something that I want to do, and is what I did with the printers. Mm -hmm. And I saw the printers as a very open target, uh, especially with how many like everybody in your own everybody's home has a printer, right? Mm -hmm. um, every business has a printer. Uh, and a lot of people don't look at them for something that you could exploit, right? Hmm. So then you're, uh, you, you create a pretty big vulnerability right there. So my, my whole, uh, thing was to create a challenge for myself while not, um, affecting others in a bad way, I guess you could say, right? Yeah, I got you. Good on you. Good on you. How'd you get started hacking? Well, around uh, seven years old, I actually, you know what, that's actually a really good question here. Sorry, I'm just um, thinking about my timeline, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'd say probably around six or seven. Like, um, I guess there's, there's a point in, in your, like, you're growing up in an era unlike I did. So yeah. when I was when I was in high school is when I realized, hey, I can hack systems and I can mm -hmm. make them do what I want them to do. There must have been a point in your life where you said, hey, I can do more than what Windows allows me to do, what Linux allows me to do. What, yeah. When was that point for you? Probably around 10 or 11, I'd say, mm -hmm. when I started, um, when a lot of people on the internet started coming out and showing uh, to the public, like what you can do with this and how everything can be explained. And I thought, huh, 
but <laughs> you know, I can do that way. Really. Um, and I wanted to learn that ability, uh, more so for good than bad, right? Okay. Yeah. So probably around 10 or 11, yeah. And, uh, and these devices, you mentioned printers, and we're going to talk more about that, but these devices are benign, considered safe. These are, mm-hmm. these are devices that people trust to plug into their network. I mean, you walk into any super center, you buy a printer and you install it and it just works. Yeah. What is it that drew you to start attacking those devices? Well, I would say it's more of a, um, or giving me a little bit easier of an access than a more sophisticated system. So it was easy enough for me to do, but um, hard enough for me to still have a challenge. Yeah. And there was a large amount of them, like a surplus of, of uh, printers on uh, any given network. So, you know, you're, uh, I have a lot of access to them and it uh, made it a little bit easier. Sorry, I'm kind of gone off track there, but. Uh, no, not at all, not at all. So, but it makes me think though, and we're speaking with the Canadian hacker here, the Canadian hacker, we, we know you by no other name. Um, when you're attacking printers, so so I think as a cons- so me as a consumer or our viewers as consumers will purchase a printer and just install it on their network. So what makes that device a vulnerable device? You just think it's a benign device just sitting on your network that you print to. Well, it's like, go ahead. How are we able to attack that? How? What is? What is it that I should know as a consumer that you can share with me as a as a hacker that I should know about that printer being connected to my network? Well, all devices have a form of like security feeder, I guess you can say. Um, you might think that they're safe when they're really truly not. And for printers, in this case, um, there's a lot of open ports on your network that uh, it can be accessed with, which I don't mean that you don't, you shouldn't connect it to your network. I mean, it makes it so much easier to print anything off, but you just have to be really careful with what's exposed because um, there's uh, ports 9100, 515 and 631, which are the main three ports that, um, and it's mainly 9100. That 631, people, isn't that cups? Yeah, that's yeah. cups. So you got to be really, really careful with um, what you're exposing. Um, and you just always got to be watching out with what you're installing to your network, what you're adding to your network. Because I could nest, I could get into that printer. And um, if I wanted to attack it for malicious reasons, uh, let's say you're a large business, I could, anything you print off, finance reports or anything, I would actually be able to uh, use a man in the middle attack. and take it off. So, oh, or, man. so you really have to be careful with what you're putting or connecting to your network. And you should always be checking um, your settings on your uh, modem or, I mean, more people know it as a router, but it's really a modem, right? Um, uh, to see what ports you're allowing to pass through to the external side of your network. And that makes me think, now the Canadian hacker, you're, you're dropping a bunch of bombs here, so I got to cut you off because like, okay, we got to talk about this. UPnP is enabled on a lot of routers. Yeah. U, UPnP means as soon as you plug that printer in, it opens up the ports. It doesn't matter if you specifically said open up those ports. No, UPnP will automatically do that because it detects the new printer and allows it to open those ports automatically. That's yeah. dangerous. That's what I'm learning here. But you're talking about, okay, not only are you able to send print jobs to my printer, but you're able to intercept the print jobs that I send to my printer. Exactly, yeah. And you can see how dangerous that is, right? Oh, um, oh and, a yeah. of, and a lot of the security features on printers that say like, oh yeah, um, they won't be saved on the system or anything like that, um, really don't help at all because it's not, it's again, a form of security feeder. You're really thinking it's more safe than it truly is. I can't help but think about accounting firms, lawyers' yeah. offices who just, okay, let's back up a second. The Canadian hacker has revealed themselves 
to the world and said, look, your printers are unsafe. You need to secure these things. What if there are 10 other hackers who have accessed that printer and have never even unveiled the fact that they have access to that printer? Is no. there, isn't it true, the Canadian hacker, that they could compromise this printer and be receiving every single print job from this lawyer's office, from this accounting office, from wherever this office is, and never you'd never be the wiser. You'd just be sending them this information. Is that a valid point? It's a very valid point, and that is very true. Um, of course, I've never necessarily seen that in action, but it is definitely in the realm of possibilities. Um, you know, if you have anything that's open to the network, open to your network, um, there's IP crawlers that can... Uh, go through every single IP address in the world and it will tell you exactly what ports there are. And then, um, for example, sites like Shodan uh, or uh, hostels, like they show them online. And then anybody with the malicious intent, like the people you said or that you stated, uh, can use that to um, or, uh, create man-in-mill attacks or copy off any files, permanently damage your printer, or just do mostly anything to your printer. Unreal. Uh, to speak now. Getting away from printers, are there other devices that we as consumers may pick up, whether they be from a retailer or from, say, our internet service provider, that would allow us to be compromised without us even thinking about the security aspect of it? Oh, there are tons. Um, a really big example that I personally found in. I was that I actually experienced myself in my own home mm -hmm. was um, a certain ISP company that I'm not going to state, uh, but I would say a major ISP in Canada. Uh, what did install a modem in my own home that replaced my past modem, uh, and it actually opened up the web interface to the public, and uh, these. And it had a standard like username and password, like admin no, password, right, like a so, default like admin password. <laughs> yeah. Oh my exactly. goodness. So and so many people don't understand that this is such a huge issue. Yeah. Um, and they like I haven't contacted them about it. Um, I probably should, and I most likely will in the future, mm -hmm. but. You really have to be careful with what you're installing onto your network because, uh, especially with that, like that did send a bit of a shock. Yeah. Um, uh, because with that, anybody could log into my modem. Yeah. Um, and then you could do more basic things like reset it or uh, power it off. But then it also gives you more access to your network than you should ever have. Like well, anybody. A modem or a router would allow me to open up, say, port 3389 yeah. on the network, which would exactly. allow me as a hacker to remotely access your computer desktop and yeah. wreak all kinds of havoc. What, what, other kinds of, what other kinds of threats does this introduce to our network? I mean, these are devices that we trust. So the internet service provider says, here's your new modem. It's going to be faster. It's going to be better. Yeah. And you don't ever think twice about the security of that device. What what does it open up to a hacker such as yourself? Now I understand that you're taking the you're taking the high road and saying you know I'm going to educate people. But what about those hackers that are saying no? I'm going to exploit people. With uh, there, <laughs> that's a very good question. I'm just going to put that right out there. Um. It is truly astonishing what you can do when you have access to these systems. Yeah. Um, like you said, I mean, I believe that's RDP port, if I'm correct. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, for example, that one, you would most likely tap, need to have that one enabled, but there's so many exploits with this and with a modem, uh, you know, you'll be able to, in most cases, you can see what is installed on the network. Uh, and then you have, and it'll show the specific IP address and you can find vulnerabilities in like CVE, for example, right? 
Oh. Um, like a CVE database. And it, it can say, oh, yeah, um, this uh, thermostat, let's just say a thermostat, you know, IoT thermostats. This thermostat has this vulnerability that hasn't been patched yet. And you can access it using this or this port and jack up the temperature or kill it or damage the thermostat. And then you can, uh, because you have access to the modem, you can open that port so you can access it yourself, even if you weren't able to before. Can I just put something out there? Because you touched on thermostats here, the Canadian hacker. I could also, as a hacker, monitor that thermostat and see when the people are coming and going. So then it brings it into a physical realm of saying, okay, well, my Nest thermostat tells whoever has access to it whether I'm home or not. Yeah. So what if I was a physical robber? It's definitely a scary world with that, with all of that. Um, for example, a lot of people have smart locks, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of them communicate through Zigbee, for example. Mm-hmm. Now you have a, um, like this hub, a central hub that connects all of those systems together. And if you don't have that set up properly or if they didn't, uh, correct any security issues that they saw present, uh, that would allow you access to, for example, unlock your door, uh, through Yikes. the network. Um, and it's really bad because they, um, a lot of systems don't use any authentication with that. I mean, there are some that do, uh, but yeah, with like one of those smart hubs, you know, it's just like if you were ha- to have your phone out, you could press a button on your phone and it would unlock the door. Yeah. Well, why can't somebody else that has access to your modem do the same thing, right? Mm. So that's an interesting up. thought. Yeah. Never even really thought and we we're always thinking in terms of, you know, the, the actual app. Well, if I have access to the modem, I can access any of the devices within the same yeah. network. That's scary stuff. Well, we're speaking with the Canadian hacker. And before we take a quick break, let's have a look at a video of how the Canadian hacker was able to compromise all those printers. Canadian hacker is not only going to be sharing with us about the response that he's received to the printer hack, but also he's going to share his concerns about how young people could use similar hacks to damage devices around the world and how governments could use it for cyber espionage. Don't go anywhere. Jumping back to your own hack of printers across Canada, the U.S., and even uh, overseas, um, what is the response that you've received? Like, have you have you gotten a lot of feedback from that hack? Yes, I have. So, with the attack or the hack, um, I added my uh, Twitter handle. Yeah, I saw that. As well as my email address. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the majority of the feedback 
has been positive and a lot of people actually contacted me to help aid with the problem uh, and a lot of older folks too they I don't know how to do this can you help me wow and I and you you know you can go step by step with it right mm-hmm. but then there are some other people which I don't necessarily know their motives but I have brought in actually a few death threats from um, Russia which is why you can see me unmasked here in this uh, Sure. Is it possible the Canadian hacker, uh, and we don't like to get into politics or <laughs> any of that kind of stuff here on Category 5, but is it possible that they're utilizing these exploits and you are educating the people to these exploits? You know what? I've actually never thought of that, and that is a very good view, I guess. You could so I um, think that is yeah. a possibility? That is very much so a possibility, yes. And I could be showing, by doing this, I could be showing the public uh, things that maybe those people who sent those threats oh, sure. uh, would want to see. Uh, yeah, that's a very, very good point. How do you think the CIA felt when Eternal Blue was revealed publicly? <laughs> you know, <laughs> no. I don't know what happened to those hackers. We yeah. just, nobody knows. Um, so looking at, so this is uh, the Canadian hacker that we're speaking with and, and, and we joke, but it, the truth is, is that the Canadian hacker has taken a very uh, higher road approach to these types of exploits and in your actual printout. So understand hundreds of thousands of printers around the world suddenly started printing out this printout from this hacker. And on this printout, it says... If you are unable to find suitable instructions, you are welcome to contact me via email or Twitter, and I'll be glad to help you out. You mentioned some older folks reaching out. Like, have you really received folks reaching out and saying, I need help with this? Yes, I have. Um, The majority of the emails I've received were people thanking me, uh, which I wasn't necessarily looking for that uh, through the email or anything like that. but. Uh, it was more to provide a support system to help people with that. And yes, I've received multitudes of emails uh, stating that they required help um, and their company uh, hasn't told them or they don't know how to, uh, things like that. And I can provide a step-by-step process. And then there's also some people, some people that don't necessarily know how I did the exploit but you know how fix the problem and they've contacted me to test it again to make sure that their printer is inaccessible. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So uh, are you going to continue hacking printers in this way? Oh, most definitely. Um, I am going to be sending out another wave of an unidentified amount. They're not an unidentified but I don't know how many printers I'll be sending this out to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm thinking maybe 500,000. Uh, so that will be a much larger amount of printers that I sent it to before, but also, sorry, I'm kind of lost myself there. No, that, no, you're, um, you're fantastic. And, and we appreciate your time so very much. The Canadian hacker, so many hackers would utilize these types of exploits. For example, I mean, you're talking about sending, you've already sent to over a hundred thousand printers printout jobs okay uh and now we're talking about the next wave being another five hundred thousand printers where a lot of hackers would just like hey let's print out a mass amount of porn on all these business printers let's like print out some some horrible things this is you know the approach of the traditional hacker and this is how uh, i think media has painted the hacker so we have this picture of what a hacker is and that's what we expect of them. What has caused you to take a different approach and instead send to 600,000 printers instructions and assistance with helping to close these exploits? Well, I, I would always want to take the high ground or the moral route. Um, I have never thought, or not not necessarily thought, but never um, ever wanted to uh, hack any devices uh, for immoral purposes 
or um, to do it for reasons of my own uh, that personally wouldn't like necessarily aid them. So I think it was just, I wanted to be able to make a difference in something without necessarily hurting uh, the persons involved. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much about it. Sorry. Like, you, <laughs> you, you live up to the, the, the handle of the Canadian hacker by apologizing, but what, <laughs> what you're revealing to us, I, I just envision like a new world of philanthropy in a way, mm-hmm. like as a hacker, you're choosing to help others by exploiting the very things that are exploitable within their networks. Mm-hmm. So you're saying, hey, by the way, <laughs> your printers could be used for these malicious purposes, but I want to yeah. help you to lock those down. Exactly. And of course, I didn't have to do that. If I wanted to, I could um, or completely destroy those printers by writing the EEP ROM over and over and over again. Uh, which takes about tw- 24 hours and that would completely kill the printer. Uh, I could do that. I could print off, uh, some images that you wouldn't necessarily want to be printed off. Yeah. Um, things like that. I could, uh, permanently etch like a watermark onto it. Um, but not necessarily text. You could do anything you wanted, any image. Uh, but yeah, I've chosen to, you know, <laughs> Oh, I'm just picturing all the all the things that you could do, but you're choosing yeah. the high road, dude. Kudos and 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 well done. Um, do you have plans? You know, stepping away from the so the printer hack has been a successful hack, and and you've been making a difference for those who receive it and realize, oh my goodness, my printer is exploitable, but this hacker has chosen to to tell me about it. So that I'm no longer susceptible. What what do you have planned beyond that? So when this has exhausted itself, what's the next step for the Canadian hacker? Well, I've kind of t- taken a look at uh, two career paths. Um, I've o- I still always want to do ethical hacking, depending on whatever career I choose, and I definitely want to definitely don't want to go on to the dark side of that either. Yeah. Uh, with any black hat or anything like that. So I've been looking at, uh, like cyber, any sort of cybersecurity, uh, jobs or anything like that. Um, seeing if I can get a degree of some sort with that. Um, or I've also been looking at engineering, electrical or mechanical. Very so, cool. So you're talking sure. about, you're talking about career paths as, future tense. So am I to understand that you are younger than 20? Uh, yes, I am. I'm actually in uh, grade 10, so high school here in Canada. So I still have a good bit of time, but it, it kind of just goes to show that if I'm able to do this as a grade 10 student, then what does somebody with a lot more knowledge who's actually got a degree in this? Uh, can do if they wanted to, right? And the Canadian hacker, what this is, what this is revealing to me is that if you can do this and you can choose the the moral road and ha- help people to secure their networks, what about the next grade ten student? Like folks, I mean, there's a lot of people who just woke up and said, "Oh my goodness!" Like, and I apologize, the Canadian hacker, but you. Some people are saying, this is a kid. What we've learned here is that you could have used this exploit for for malicious purposes, and you haven't, personally. But what about the next grade 10 kid? And not not to necessarily hurt my own generation here, but there are not great people out there, especially of my age group. And if they so desire to do this, like, you know, the possibilities are almost endless. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have to be printers, right? It uh, can be any sort of IoT device or anything connected to your network. Wow. Uh, Well, I encourage you, as we wrap up this interview, the Canadian Hacker, I encourage you to continue pursuing that 
positive path. There are a lot of cybersecurity companies out there that want people like you that can exploit systems for the good so that they can help patch them. And, uh, and I encourage you to pursue that career path. Absolutely. And, and keep up the great work in what you're doing. And I, and I hope that everything goes very, very well for you. Thank you. The Canadian Hacker, do you have any final words for us today as we close off our interview? Well, if I've hacked your printer, I'm sorry. All right. Thanks for being on the show. We've got to head over to the newsroom. Sasha, if you are all set. I am. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. A man hid the keys to a $59 million worth of Bitcoin with his fishing gear, which got thrown out and incinerated while he was in jail. Firefox has turned on encrypted DNS by default to thwart snooping ISPs. Automatic pet feeding systems could starve your pet in the event of a failure. Musicians have algorithmically generated every possible melody and released them to the public domain. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Robbie Ferguson. All right, Sasha. Well, some quick honorable mentions this week. Let's get into it. Pioneering African-American NASA mathematician Katherine Johnson has passed away. I want to get into a little bit about her story. And as Johnson calculated, she calculated the rocket trajectories and Earth orbits for NASA's early space missions. She was portrayed in the 2016 Oscar-nominated film Hidden Figures, and the film tells the story of an African-American woman whose math skills uh, helped to put U.S. astronauts John Glenn into orbit around the Earth in 1962. Miss Johnston uh, verified the calculations made by new electronic computers before his flight. Imagine that. Computers yeah. were brand new at the time. So they were like, human, check yes. this data. So we had to like verify that data. And there she was verifying it, making sure that the math was correct from this new fandangled device, right? Miss Johnston, uh, Miss Johnson, pardon me, had previously calculated the trajectories for the space flight of Alan Shepard, uh, the first American in space. Um, and um, such was her skill and reputation that Glenn had asked her specifically to be a part of his mission and refused to fly unless she verified the calculations. She also helped to calculate the trajectory from uh, the 1969 Apollo 11 flight to the moon. Now, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein describes Miss Johnson as a leader from NASA's pioneering days. He says, Miss Johnson helped our, um, helped our nation enlarge the frontiers of space, even as she made huge strides that also opened doors for women and people of color in the universal human quest to explore space. Her dedication and skill as a mathematician helped put humans on the moon, and before that, made it possible for our astronauts to take the first steps in space that we are now following on a journey to Mars. Here in 2020, Miss Johnson was born in a small town in West Virginia in 1918. She excelled academically. She graduated from high school at just 14 years old and from university at 18. NASA notes that her academic achievements were partially, uh, were particularly, pardon me, impressive. Quote, in an era when school for African Americans normally stopped at eighth grade for those who could indulge that luxury. To think of education as a luxury at that time. Just an astonishing woman. 
After working as a teacher and being a stay-at-home mom, Miss Johnson began working for NASA's predecessor, the National Advisory Committee for a- uh, Aeronomics. Pardon me. Uh, they called it NACA at the time. In, uh, she started working there in 1953. Johnson died at a retirement home in Newport, February 24th, at the age of 101. Lived a long life. Uh, Bridenstine described her as, quote, an American hero. And he stated that her pioneering legacy will never be forgotten. Since we're already on the subject of mankind traveling to the stars, the Los Angeles City Council has approved a SpaceX permit to lease 19 acres of land in the city's port for 20 years for a Starship rocket facility. SpaceX's new rocket factory will be for its massive next-generation rocket called Starship, The rocket so far has been developed at SpaceX's facilities in Texas and Florida, but the new location adds capacity for SpaceX within driving distance to its headquarters outside of Los Angeles International Airport, and that's where the majority of their staff actually work. That's 6,000 employees. Uh, In an outline of plans described by government officials, SpaceX's facility will include multiple buildings for manufacturing, such as blacksmith shops and machining. Los Angeles officials say that SpaceX's plan will actually refurbish dilapidated facilities with a history of vacancy and vandalism and, quote, has the potential to create 130 aerospace jobs. The facility itself would be a large tent-like structure, similar to those that Tesla was using to ramp up their production of the cars in recent years. The port location provides SpaceX with immediate access to water. That's a key transportation item for them, uh, for their immense rocket, uh, because they need to get that from a production facility to the launch site in either Texas or Florida. So SpaceX currently moves Falcon 9 rockets across the highway on super long trucks. But Starship and its super heavy booster would be so large, they wouldn't be able to uh, transport that by the road. So the water is going to play a big part in that. Mm -hmm. Researchers have developed an algorithm that could stop self-driving vehicles from getting into crashes and traffic jams. The algorithm divides the ground beneath the machines into a grid. The robots learn their position through technology similar to GPS and coordinate their own movements together through sensors that assess where there's free space to move. Northwestern engineers Michael Rubenstein says the robots refuse to move to a spot until that spot is free and until they know that no other robots are moving to that same spot. They are careful and reserve a space ahead of time. Rubenstein's team tested their algorithm on a swarm of 100 robots set up in their lab. To cut out any distractions, the robots were only allowed to sense three or four of their closest neighbors. This restricted their vision, uh, and it made the system easier to scale, as the robots can interact locally without needing global information. Think about the impact of that. So the advantage of a swarm of robots is that there is no centralized controller that can disrupt the whole system. This allows them to work together to accomplish any task, even if one of them breaks down. This gives the system an obvious application in warehouse robots, but Rubenstein believes uh, it could actually also cut traffic and collisions for self-driving vehicles on the road. He said, quote, by understanding how to control our swarm robots to form shapes, we can understand how to control fleets of autonomous vehicles as they interact with each other. 
Finally, cybersecurity researchers today uncovered a, a new highly severe hardware vulnerability residing in the widely used Wi-Fi chips manufactured by Broadcom and Cypress. Apparently, they power over a billion devices, including smartphones, tablets, laptops, routers, and IoT gadgets. Dubbed Crook, K-R-0-0-K, the flaw could let nearby remote attackers intercept and decrypt some wireless network packets transmitted over the air by a vulnerable device. The attacker doesn't need to be connected to the victim's wireless network, and the flaw works against vulnerable devices using WPA2 personal or WPA2 uh, enterprise protocols with AES CCMP encryption. ESET researchers said, quote, our tests confirmed some client devices by Amazon, Echo, Kindle, Apple, the iPhone, iPad, MacBook, Google's Nexus device, Samsung's Galaxy devices, Raspberry Pi's Pi 3, and Xiaomi's Redmi, as well as some access points by Asus and Huawei, were vulnerable to Crook. Now, the attack relies on the fact that when a device suddenly gets disconnected from the wireless network, the Wi-Fi chip clears the session key in the memory, and it sets it to zero, but see the chip inadvertently transmits all data frames left in the buffer with an all, ze uh, with an all zero encryption key, even after the disassociation. So it's actually pushing out that data without encryption. So therefore, of course, an attacker in a near proximity to vulnerable devices can use the flaw to repeat of, repeatedly trigger disassociation by sending de-authentication packets over the air to capture more data frames, quote, potentially containing sensitive data, including DNS, ARP, ICMP, HTTP, TCP, and TLS packets. Basically, it's like a man in the middle without actually having to be in the middle. Besides this, since the flaw also affects chips embedded into wireless routers, the issue also makes it possible for attackers to intercept and decrypt network traffic transmitted from connected devices that are not vulnerable to crook, either attached or using different Wi-Fi chips. So consider that if you are connecting to a Wi-Fi hotspot whose hotspot is vulnerable, you are susceptible to crook. Apple has already released patches for its users. Some should have issued advisories or security patches at the time of the publication, and other vendors are still testing the issue against their devices. Watch for, patch, uh, for patches to mitigate this problem via software or firmware updates for your device. Wow, thank you. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. In a world where various mass breaches dictate the use of strong, randomized passwords more than ever, reliable and secure credentials management is paramount in 2020. One Irish drug dealer has evidently learned the lesson the hard way. This week, the Irish Times reported the sad tale of Clifton Collins, a 49-year-old cannabis grower from Dublin. Collins quietly grew and sold his product for 12 years, and he amassed a small fortune by using some of that revenue to buy bitcoins around 2011 and 2012 before the price of cryptocurrency soared. But in 2017, state authorities on a routine overnight patrol spotted and then arrested Collins with roughly $2,000 of cannabis in his car. The man quickly earned himself a five-year jail sentence. As part of authorities' investigation, Ireland's Criminal Assets Bureau discovered and confiscated 12 Bitcoin wallets belonging to Collins, totaling nearly $59 million, reportedly the biggest financial case in CAB's 25-year history. There was only one problem. CAB couldn't access the accounts because Collins had lost the keys. 
Nervous about having a ton of money tied up in a single wallet, Collins diversified in 2016 by splitting his 6,000 bitcoins across 12 newly created wallets. And to further secure this fortune, Collins hid a piece of paper containing the access codes inside a fishing rod case at his home. Unfortunately, a separate criminal broke into Collins' home in 2017 and cleared his belongings. And upon Collins' arrest, his former home was cleared out by his landlord with left-behind belongings taken to a dump. Dump workers told state police they remember seeing fishing gear, but waste from this particular dump is set to Germany and China and incinerated by procedure. The fishing rod case has been missing ever since. Collins told the Irish police that he has had time to come to terms with the loss of the money and regarded it as punishment for his own stupidity. This makes me want to cry. Right, okay. Wow. So that money would not have been his in the end. Which is why he's kind of okay with losing it. I think. Oh my goodness. <laughs> like but he's dude. not upset about it. <laughs> oh. Because he's been caught. Yeah. Back up. Where are your backups? Right. I, I understand the In idea. In the lure box. The tackle box. Is yeah. that what they call it? Tackle box with backups. <laughs> Fishing rod for the main. Believe me, I understand the idea, the concept behind a paper wallet. Yeah. But paper wallet as a term doesn't necessarily mean that you have to print it on a piece of paper which is susceptible to everything. Yeah. A paper wallet, think about it this way, an offline wallet, right? Like it could yeah. be an encrypted, GPG encrypted file on your hard drive, which is also uh, Luke's encrypted. And right. that can be your protection. And, and then back it up. I, you know what? Six. I am slightly suspicious, actually, of this story, Mr. Collins. Why? When you're released from jail, if all of a sudden you disappear, <laughs> maybe you uh, had. Excuse me. I'm going fishing. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you had your <laughs> keys elsewhere. Oh, boy. Maybe. Okay. So where do you keep your crypto keys? So think about So your wallets and your keys. Your wallet is reasonably easy to recover as long as you know your wallet address. Mm -hmm. It's that private key that you're not going to be able to recover if you don't have it. So encryption, I mean, use, uh, like, can I skip off? Can I skip yeah, off the set yeah, for a absolutely. second here, Sasha? I'm jumping over here and I know you guys can't see me, but I just want to grab a device right. from Kingston Tech. Okay, so Kingston has these guys. Would not stand up against an incinerator, though. Wouldn't stand up against an incinerator, incinerator but perfect. a Data Traveler 2000 has an encryption keypad. So save your GPG encrypted keys yes. on this, encrypted with the keypad, and then back it up to multiple devices. Like, yes. Like, come on. When you've got millions and millions of dollars in Bitcoin, you can afford to buy a Data Traveler 2000. Don't be dumb. Daft, as they would say. This is yeah. Irish. Don't be right. daft, Mr. Collins. Don't be a prat. Oh, good. Come on right. now. But, you, like, yeah. Right? That <laughs> just breaks my heart in so many ways, but it's just like, okay, this guy obviously knew his way around the cryptocurrency. I mean, he, but yeah. maybe he was just lucky. Maybe he just he bought it at the right time and didn't upon know it. better. Yeah, heard some, some chattering at the local pub. Evidently, I'm painting a picture of who this guy is. He's sitting there, <laughs> sipping a pint of Guinness, <laughs> listening to some... So I bought a thousand Bitcoin last week. Ah, <laughs> oh, that'll never be worth anything, they said. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote it down on a napkin. They were like I, they're only like, 20 cents each, I they said. Any, like, oh my poster. goodness. Nah, to be a Guinness. I'm going fishing, boys. Yeah. <laughs> so the question becomes, okay, so think about it. Where are your keys? Okay, so if you yeah. collect cryptocurrency, where are your keys? How are they safe? Do you have a device like a Data Traveler 2000 from Kingston? Um, I have one. And if not, get one, okay? Because mm -hmm. this is a great device to store your keys on. But I wouldn't just I wouldn't just put my 
files on here, I would also encrypt those files with GPG, right? So you've got multiple layers of encryption. Mm -hmm. And heck, if you want to Luke's encrypt this as well, <laughs> triple layer encryption, that's fine. And then you can back that up to multiple devices, create a DD image. I don't care what you do, but you need to have a backup of your keys. Yes. And an offline key does not necessarily mean that there's only one copy. No, you can still have backups. But I think that is safer than the paper key because the paper key can be picked up by anyone. So that robber, if he recognized it and he also had the wallets, I'm saying he, I'm just assuming it was probably a woman. <laughs> but if the robber <laughs> was to get a hold of the keys, the private keys on paper, as well as the wallets, well, they've got all your $69 billion, whatever it is. A lot of money. A lot of money. Right? Right. So at least with encryption, you can have multiple copies of your file backed yeah. up that has your keys, but don't just print what them. What a tale this will be for him when he gets out after. I, I don't know if his sentence is up yet, but when he gets out and he's just talking to somebody who's never met him before and he tells them the tale about <laughs> how he lost so much money, they'll think that he is lying. Yeah. All right. Firefox has begun the process of switching browser users to Cloudflare's encrypted DNS service this week. The change rolls out across the United States in the coming weeks. DNS over HTTPS helps keep eavesdroppers from seeing what DNS lookups your browser is making, potentially making it more difficult for internet service providers or other third parties to monitor what websites you visit. Mozilla's embrace of DNS over HTTPS is fueled in part by concerns about ISPs monitoring customers' web usage. Mobile broadband providers were caught selling their customers' real-time location data to third parties, and internet providers can use browsing history to deliver targeted ads. Wireless and wired internet providers are suing the state of Maine to stop a web browsing privacy law that would require ISPs to get customers opt-in consent before using or sharing browsing history and other sensitive data. The telecom companies already convinced Congress to eliminate a similar federal law in 2017. With web users already being tracked heavily by companies like Google and Facebook, Mozilla had said it is embracing DNS over HTTPS because, quote, we don't want to see that business model duplicated in the middle of a network, and it's just a mistake to use DNS for those purposes, end quote. Mozilla said in an announcement Tuesday, quote, today we know that unencrypted DNS is not only vulnerable to spying, but is being exploited. And so we are helping the internet to make the shift to more secure alternatives. We do, we do this by performing DNS lookups in encrypted HTTPS connection. This helps hide your browsing history from attackers on the network and helps prevent data collection by third parties on the network that ties your computer to websites you visit, end quote. While Firefox's encrypted DNS uses Cloudflare by default, users can change that to next DNS in the Firefox setting or manually enter the address of another encrypted DNS service. Firefox users can also disable the new default setting if they don't want to use any of the encrypted DNS options. Google's plan for encrypted DNS in Chrome, which is still in the experimental phase and hasn't been deployed to everyone, is a little different from Mozilla's. Instead of automatically switching users to a DNS provider chosen by Google, Chrome sticks with whichever DNS provider the user has selected. If the user-selected DNS provider offers encrypted lookups and is in the list of providers, Chrome automatically upgrades the user to that DNS provider's encrypted service. If the user-selected DNS provider isn't in the list, Chrome makes no changes. See, that makes more sense to me. Yeah. Don't touch my DNS settings, browser. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. Swessig. No. I mean, we're going uh, we're gonna to divide the community right now. My belief is that my web browser Mm -hmm. should not touch my DNS. Mm. It shouldn't touch my IP address. It shouldn't touch my 
default gateway, right? You're all agreeing with that. So why is it touching my DNS? My browser should be subject to my operating system's DNS settings. My operating system should be making these decisions. Ubuntu should be saying, hey, we're going to try to encourage our users to use HTTPS for DNS queries. My browser should never be allowed to override my DNS. Right. I see what you're saying. That's my opinion. My browser is to be able to surf the web mm -hmm. based on the settings which I have set in my operating system mm -hmm. for, TCI, uh, for my TCIP stack, for my DNS stack, for my gateway. Now, what about a consumer or a user who isn't as knowledgeable as you? Would this suit them? I think that is the exception to right. where I think this works. Yeah. I think this works for the average Windows user, we'll mm -hmm. say, like the average home user who just bought a laptop from the future shop. Yes. From Walmart and fires it up and installs Firefox, hopefully, because they're not going to use Edge because they're smarter than that, uh -huh. at least. Yes. Right? But you trust your browser. And, and so it, that user, sure, I mean, use HTTPS. But here's my problem is that I set, I have a pie hole. <laughs> That's right, you do. Oh, I have a DNS server on my network that is on a Odroid XU4 and a Cloud Shell 2. That pie hole powered device. So pie hole is the operating system. It's a DNS server. It uses by nine and it controls the flow of DNS through my network. Mm -hmm. So if my kids go to something that daddy says is objectionable, it will block it. So what Firefox is saying is, I don't care what daddy says. I'm going to go around what daddy says, and I'm going to go directly to Cloudflare. And right. if the kid, whatever the kids type in, I don't care because I'm Firefox. I know what's what. Yeah. So I'm going to go, I'm going to circumvent your pie hole. <laughs> ah, every time I say it, I laugh. <laughs> it's called pie hole. Okay. It's a DNS server using by name. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so I block things like advertisements. Yeah. Pornography. Uh, things like gambling sites and stuff that I'm that, you know, Extreme I, even violence. yeah, even stuff that I just think that the kids should maybe approach me about if they need access to it. Right. Just so that I can explain why they might want to be careful on those sites. Yeah. So so I try to control those things, not from a control freak perspective, but from a I want to be a parent who protects my children and in this connected world and firefox is saying you know what yeah and i hate that so if my kids are using firefox they are circumventing the settings that daddy set up to protect my kids that i don't like so i mm. but i do understand for the average person who goes into walmart and buys a laptop yes. and installs firefox this is safer Right. Because nobody needs to know what URLs you are going to. Right. And like Sasha from 2009, I don't even know when I started the show. 2000, see, Sasha from 2011 wouldn't have known anything about technology. Like I wouldn't have known. I would have just la -di -da -di -da, walked into a store, picked up a computer, brought it home, plugged it in, and probably would have believed any pop-up that showed up on my computer. Right? Yeah. And so th those are the people <laughs> that need to oh, be, right? No, absolutely. And, uh, but uh, like the, the adults, sure. But yeah. for, for, I mean, there are so many great uses for being able. And I understand that the, the approach or the promotional end of it. So mm -hmm. the, we'll say the marketing perspective that Firefox is using is that this protects you because now your internet service provider can't see what domain you go to. So if mm -hmm. you punch in a pornographic website into your URL bar, your ISP knows that. Right. But so does daddy. And so daddy can say, I don't want my kids to see that. Yes. I want to protect them from that. Mm -hmm. So please, Firefox, don't turn that off. Yes. I have to be able to see those domains. Mm-hmm. So that's why I have a problem with it. I agree that HTTPS is important, but there are times when maybe Google's approach is better. 
Right. Because Google is saying, if you already have something set in Chrome, in your browser, in your operating system, we will honor that, but we'll try to switch to HTTPS. So Google is saying, if you have a pie hole, <laughs> I'll still go through your pie hole. But then Daddy can set the pie holes DNS server to an HTTPS server. So the ISP cannot see what yeah. my family is putting in. So daddy can still see it because the browser no longer has the power to override. Mm -hmm. But the ISP cannot because my pie hole, which is the override of my systems. See, that is good. Is able to direct. Okay. Google so wins. I can make that decision because I'm yes. smart enough. Yeah. You're smart enough to make that decision. So there should be a process that Firefox has for some reason forgotten to put into place. There should mm -hmm. be a process of qualifying, is this user capable of making these decisions for themselves? Yes. Or do we actually need to override for them? Right. Okay. That's my perspective. Please comment below. I know we're probably going to have some mixed perspectives here on this topic. Mm -hmm. But my perspective is from the father who just wants to protect his kids. I like it. Thank you. Comment below. We have to take a quick break. More of this week's top tech stories are coming up. Don't go. Welcome back. Owners of a device designed to release food for pets say their animals were left hungry during a week-long in this instance, the device was one from PetNet. However, such devices are being trusted by pet owners. PetNet allows owners to schedule and control feeding via a smartphone app. One pet owner tweeted, My cat starved for over a week, while others complained about other hardware issues. Quote, My three Gen 2 feeders constantly jam and won't dispense food, wrote another. Some expressed relief that the feeders were now back online. PetNet has two Twitter accounts. The official one has not tweeted since August 2019, but the, the, the support account issued four tweets between last week and now about the problems experienced. In its first tweet, it said a system outage was affecting second generation devices and asked customers not to switch off their feeder even if it appeared to be offline. It said automatic feeds would, quote, still dispense. Four days later, it tweeted again to say that it hoped to release more information soon. On Friday, it said its smart feeders were, quote, returning online and a system reset was in progress. Stuart Miles, founder of the tech site PocketLint, says, quote, as we go towards a more automated home, you have to acknowledge that Somewhere along the line, things will fall over. Robots and automated systems have hiccups along the way. It's something we need to get used to, end quote. This particular outage, though, points to a need for pet owners to have a backup plan. A friend or family member to check in on the pets every couple of days may be all it takes to ensure that if tech fails, a human is there to ensure things are safe and cared for. Yeah, it makes sense. It, re it really reminds me of the Tesla automated autonomous vehicles. Yes. And how there have been some crashes and it's while they're watching a movie or right. talking on the phone or it, like. This is what. OK, so this is why I don't think robots are going to take over the world and all the humans well, are going to. Totally are. No, yeah. Well, they need us. <laughs> robots need people as yeah. much as people need robots. We got to keep them in check. You can have an automated cat feeder. Like I think of people I know in my daily life that really could use an automated cat feeder to help assist them mm -hmm. in feeding their cat. But they're not going to hightail it out for two weeks and assume that the cat's going to be fine with their automated kitty litter cleaner and their automated mm -hmm. cat feeder. Like they... They're going to stay there. You can't just trust your cat's life to technology kind of ever. <laughs> yeah. I, I Like, I trust technology. Yes. 
But when it comes to life and death, health, wellness, I think it's important for us to still be the human, right? Like autonomous vehicles still have a steering wheel for a reason. Yes. You're meant to observe what's going on around you. Yes. But sit there and relax. Enjoy the music and just kind of look around and enjoy nature for once. Be a passenger. But as soon as you start swerving toward the guardrail, be like, grab a hold of the damn steering wheel and take control. Right. I, I honestly don't think that the pet feeder company is at fault in this. Systems go well, off. They are. Line. They totally yeah. are. But our complacency in trusting a digitally connected device to provide life-giving food right. to our pets yes. so, is a problem. Right. They didn't say, hey, leave your cat alone for a week. No. Well, maybe they did. I didn't see oh, the marketing yeah, material, but... I hope you didn't. Understand, this is a connected <laughs> device that if Wi-Fi goes down, if internet goes down, if their servers go down, which is what happened here, mm-hmm. your f- pets will not get fed. Right. Think about that for a second. So we need to still make sure... Like, I, I set an automatic plant feeder yes. when, when I go away for my annual vacation, okay? Mm-hmm. And it feeds my cucumbers, and it keeps my garden fed, yeah. but my sister-in-law still checks in for us. Right. Every couple of days, she goes in and waters the plants and does it, makes sure everything's working. Right. Because I don't want to come back to a bunch of dead cucumbers. Just in case something yeah. happens. Don't just... Right. Willy-nilly trust the tech. We, we can as a convenience. Yeah. But please don't trust it to give life. I would never trust a robot to keep me alive without human intervention. Like You say that now, but wait till you're 95. No, there will be people there, <laughs> There though. will be nurses. There will be people <laughs> yes, there checking exactly. to make sure the robots yeah. are doing the right thing. Or Pepper. It could be Pepper. Oh, Pepper. She's so cute. Pepper can be my nurse. (laughs) Okay. Two programmer musicians wrote every possible melody in existence to a hard drive in MIDI format, copyrighted the whole thing, and then released it all to the public domain in an attempt to stop musicians from getting sued. Programmer, musician, and copyright attorney Damien Real, along with musician programmer Noah Rubin, sought to stop copyright lawsuits that they believe stifle the creative freedom of artists. Often in copyright cases for song melodies, if the artist being sued for infringement could have possibly had access to the music they're accused of copying, even if it was something they listened to just once, they can be accused of subconsciously infringing on the original content. One of the most notorious examples of this is Tom Petty's claim that Sam Smith's Stay With Me sounded too close to Petty's I Won't Back Down. Smith eventually had to give Petty co-writing credits on his own chart-topping song, which entitled Petty to royalties. Defending a case like that in court can cost millions of dollars in legal fees, and the outcome is never assured. Real and Rubin hope that by releasing the melodies publicly, they'll prevent a lot of these cases from standing a chance in court. In a recent talk about the project, Real explained that to get their melody database, they algorithmically determined every melody contained within a single octave. To determine the finite nature of melodies, Real and Rubin developed an algorithm that recorded every possible 8-note, 12-beat melody combo. This used the same basic tactic that hackers use to guess passwords churning through every possible combination of notes until none remained. Real says this algorithm works at a rate of 300,000 melodies per second. Oh. I know. Once a work is committed to a tangible format, it's considered copyrighted, and in MIDI format, notes are just numbers. All of the melodies they've generated, as well as the codes for the algorithm that generated them, are available as open source materials on GitHub, and the data sets are on the Internet Archive. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. That is so cool. Oh, my goodness. 
And who, uh, this is like, this should go into the files of why didn't we think of this before? These guys should get a super award. Like, they should actually get a small royalty from all of the royalties that these other big bully <laughs> musicians. Yeah. So now I want to download the entire MIDI set. Yeah. At, like, a tribute Ederol orchestral to all the MIDI mm -hmm. notes and... Resequence everything, add some drum loops, <laughs> and let's see what we come up with. I think this is great. I think it's, it's obviously novel, but it's also a brilliant way to thwart. Like, this is the equivalent. Uh, copyright trolls are the equivalent of patent trolls in, mm -hmm. in many, many ways. So, oh yeah, that sounds... I mean, there's only so many chords we can use in, in our, right. you know, four-fourths and three-fourths time. Yeah. And and they do start like I mean bare naked ladies, you know, G D C G D C G D C E minor. Like how many songs are yeah. going to fall into that? And and you can creatively have a thought that is similar to somebody else's very creative unique thought. Sure. But you didn't hear it even. Like it <laughs> it you can people have said things that I've said, I'm sure. Um, without hearing me say them, they're not stealing my thoughts. I, I just feel like in this particular case, especially the example, Tom Petty was being very petty. <laughs> ah, yeah, nice yeah, one. See? I think that, um, since the only person who is able to create unique melodies is Sia these days, <laughs> um, it, it just comes down to like, seriously, there's only so many melodies that can be made and we're coming up on a time where in recorded history there have been so many recordings made that we're going to start to see overlap mm -hmm. and we have seen that this is a cool way for them to say haha exactly. we yes. we own them all we've released them to the public domain well done thank you so much links below yes go download the midi files sequence them use them yeah create your tracks be creative. Yeah. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. Well, thanks for being with us this week. It's been great having the Canadian hacker on the show to share with us. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the show. Please comment below. Give us a like, a big subscribe and thumbs up. And uh, we look forward to having you as a part of our community. We'll see you again next week, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.